Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 30 of the Ask Historians podcast. That's right, returning 29 for the second time. Uh, and to celebrate this with us, uh, we have Husky54 coming back to finish up his uh, the second of his two-part now series on the Book of Daniel. So we'll start off this episode talking about the, the later books. These are books uh, 8 through 12 in the kind of canonical, more widely accepted uh, version of the Book of Daniel before moving into some of the Apocrypha. Uh, so we'll talk about... Um, the Prayer of Azariah, and then move on to uh, Susanna, and then we'll, we'll close out by talking about Bell and Dragon, and then just kind of uh, briefly in the episode with uh, a little bit of discussion about uh, how to how to interpret Daniel, how to how to look at it in kind of the course of uh, modern scholarship, and also a little bit and just kind of it, its own place within biblical history and biblical text. So I hope you enjoy it, uh, and uh, let's get started. Oh, I should actually point out that there is, just in the first couple minutes or so, uh, there's some uh, some audio skipping, unfortunately. I, I think this may have had to do with some sort of bad connection we were having during the recording, but um, it, it's there in, in the masters, I guess you could say, so I, I couldn't do too much to fix it. Um, but it, it does go away just after the first couple minutes, so uh, bear with us. <laughs> Ask Historians podcast. All right, so moving on to chapter eight. Actually, you know, well, just one note before we do that, because there is this this uh, one line at the the end of chapter seven, which kind of uh, kind it kind of shows the the kind of the the bifurcation of this book here. Of, of you know, kind of putting in a putting a pin on the earlier thing. So, would you go ahead and uh, just kind of tell us what that line is and just kind of the significance of it? Yeah. So we we've already made. Uh, mentioned several times about the the break between the Aramaic and the Hebrew between chapter seven and eight of of text that's that's um, been joined together with the Aramaic section and seven twenty eight count ends as for me Daniel my thoughts greatly terrified me like he says I mean it brings the account to an end and, and, and probably when it was floating around independently of the 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 last couple of chapters of Hebrew we in Revelation and things like that at the end of the book of Revelation and we don't even get Something like that at the end of twelve. See, so, yeah, let, let's go ahead and move into basically the, these uh, later chapters because they repeat a lot of the the earlier interpretations. You know, horns growing out and kingdoms succeeding kingdoms, uh, almost repetitious of themselves. So uh, let's go ahead and just kind of you know take uh, chapters eight through highlights that we see here. Yeah. So this is where we're really diving into um, uh, the Greek stuff because this is. As we mentioned earlier, this is 3 BC, probably around the time of um, the rule of Ant the their broken horns and things like that. And so we get this male goat that is the king of Greece, king of Greece. So probably Philip of Macedon is what's what's happening here, if I remember. So, um, and out of this this horn that was broken, right, is re it's replaced by four others. Uh, these are four kingdoms, and right after Alexander dies, Greece is split up into four um, smaller districts, regions, whatever, we get the Antigonids, right, we get the Seleucids, we get the Ptolemies, um, and, oh gosh, what is the fourth one? Primarily, the, the, the Ptolemies and the Seleucids are the ones that we want to concern ourselves with, though. So, the the Ptolemies, of course, are down in Egypt, the Seleucids are, are, are in charge of the Levant, the Antigonids are still back in Greece, okay? Um, so, we have these four little horns that are the four generals of, of Alexander the Great, and one of these horns, right, grows up and starts acting really arrogant and things like that. Which, I mean, the the firm question there is, how does a horn act arrogant? But <laughs> you know, we are talking about a, a personified horn at this case. Right. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. This is this is metaphorical language. So each of these horns are, are representative of individuals. Um, and I mean, we do the same thing at, uh, in English when we talk about various people in various positions of power. Yeah. So eight really starts to delve in more into what happens. Um, after Alexander the Great, and then what eventually leads up to the rise of Antiochus, Antiochus the Fourth Epiphanes, and he is like the primary villain of the story here in the latter half of Daniel, because what he does, he outlaws circumcision, he goes into the temple and sacrifices a pig upon the altar of the second temple, which of course is one of the worst kind of defilements that can really be imagined in Second Temple Judaism, right? Because pig is outlawed due to biblical food laws, yeah, right? And we do have in, in chapter 11 talking about uh, an, an abomination being set up in the temple. Right, and it's not just an abomination, it's a desolating abomination. Like it's, it's, 
it's a it's a very plain assic way of saying like this thing is really really abominable and it's most likely referring to the sacrifice of this pig on the altar and so because one of the things that's happening during the second temple period is that Jews are because of the the, the widespread Hellenization of the region and the prominence of what to them was Gentile culture, right? This is this outside non-Jewish thing, this non-Jewish identity or idea. So pig becomes another very prominent way of distinguishing themselves. And so they say, okay, the Gentiles eat pork, so we're really not going to eat. And so you, you have this offense on a number of levels. It's this outrightly like attempt at Hellenizing the temple by Antiochus IV. So, and this is, of course, where the classical story of Hanukkah comes into play, and we can talk about First and Second Maccabees, which are um, apocryphal for uh, for Protestant groups. So, we have these uh, these these other books which are kind of mirroring, you know. So, you know, Daniel's presenting this as visions that he's having during the reign of, you know, this is all taking part in what he says is like the reign of Darius. Um, you know, but we also have these kind of contemporary books, uh, like the like like you know, First and Second Maccabees, which are telling this kind of same story, but in uh, less as a this is a prophecy for the future, as kind of like this is happening now. Right. Yeah. First and first through fourth Maccabees are closer to historical writing, I would say, for the second century. Um, and more so first and second Maccabees than, than other sections, than third and fourth, I think. So yeah, uh, so we have uh, these accounts of the Maccabees, the, the, the Hasmoneans, uh, we might readily call them, or this Hasmonean period. Uh, this is this brief period for once, right, uh, post-exile, where you have Jewish people in charge of Jerusalem and the temple and things like that. It's, it's rather brief, it's only like 100 years before Rome comes in and takes back over. But we have uh, accounts of the Maccabees in First and Second Maccabees and things that are going on with them in trying to rededicate the temple, cleanse the temple, um, and purify it from this abomination that desolates that Antiochus sacrificed on the altar in the temple, this pig, right? And so what we're dealing with in, in the last third of Daniel, the book of Daniel, is an expression of a function of the oppression that second century BCE Jews are dealing with um, under the rule of Antiochus IV. And so we get a lot of language that's very anti-ruling class, right? Because if we look at all the stuff that we've already talked about in the Aramaic sections, right, Daniel is kind of almost buddy-buddy with these Mesopotamian Persian rulers, right? We don't get that in the in the last third of the book. We get a very anti, very anti-Greek, very anti-Antiochus sentiment. Kind of throughout, and and looking forward, hopeful or in hopeful anticipation of a time when Jews are ruling themselves. Yeah, and, and in a way, you know, so if we if we look at this these older books, and you know, we have these interpretations, you know, such as the uh, the statue of you know the Gabalon is the, the golden head, and then it falls, and it uh, you know this this uh, what was it, the the province of Yahweh, you know, as you, as I believe you used to put it, uh, arises. If we kind of think of that as uh, as the Jewish people in the Babylonian exile uh, reachieving self rule, when we're seeing these later chapters written, we do kind of have. We've had that achievement of self-rule in in a, in a way, and now we're having this kind of uh, domination by Greece. Um, you know, does, I mean, does this help kind of explain? In chapter nine, we have this thing about um, you'll have seventy sevens to kind of repent and atone and and bring forth, and um, and then the anointed one will be cut off after sixty two sevens, and this kind of very kind of complicated um, uh, numerical system about uh, basically. Uh, kind of saying that Jerusalem will be rebuilt, but there'll be, you know, continuing troubles and abominations. Right. So, yeah, this is a, still a function of this apocalyptic genre where they're looking forward to this act of salvation because they're, you know, talking about anointed ones and, and things like that. And specific numbers in the Bible, in a lot of places, almost in most places, you kind of have to take with a grain of salt and understand that there's some kind of symbolism going on there. So something like 70, 70 sevens, right? Um, or set like 70 weeks of years, right? This is playing off of Jeremiah and the exile. Part of it is trying to deal with 
you know, the length of the exile and how, how long it was prophesied to be, but how long it wound up being. Um, but then something like 70 is a really big number for them, so it can mean like a whole lot. And seven is also the biblical number of perfection. So we have that going on as well. So there's a lot of symbolism in these numbers as far as exactly what is being implied. So we've got, again, in chapter 9, we've got Darius the Mede. And so what's happening here in 9 is that we have the author who's probably trying to play into traditions that he's received, having to do like with the Aramaic sessions, sections on this Darius the Mede there. And so we get in 9.2, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, perceived in the books the number of years that, according to the word of Yahweh, to the prophet Jeremiah, must be fulfilled for the devastation of Jerusalem. Namely, 70 years. So that has to do directly. I mean, he's specifically referring to the exile. Because um, the exile, according to Jeremiah, was going to be 70 years long. It wound up being a little bit shorter than that. So for some people, uh, they're asking the question, well, has Jerusalem really paid her dues? Right? Because if she hasn't done the full 70 years, then maybe this is what's happening now is still a function of that, and maybe God's catching up. So we get a lot of the rest of nine here that is explicating that and, and also functioning as, as you know, this um, confession of sorts, right? We've done wrong, and, and, and so we're, we're confessing that and trying to gain favor, which is kind of why it feels like um, biblical psalm, psalmody, really. It kind of feels like a psalm in a lot of ways. So there's, there's a lot of things at play in this section. Yeah, uh, and there's and there's some more. I mean, and going you know, skipping on to chapter twelve. I mean, there's also a, a great deal of kind of um, you know numerology in there as well. You know, when it's talking about Daniel has a a, a vision on a riverbank of this very kind of which kind of in a way recounts. Um, the vision of the ram he had of about the four kingdoms and then one right. kingdom coming over and that and, that, and that's Greece and things like that. Um, but uh, and then in, in and that's chapter eleven and then chapter twelve he has uh, this kind of I mean he he kind of comes out of the vision uh, and kind of asks like well how long will that be uh, and is given uh, an incredibly ambiguous answer. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. yeah. So, it's, you know, could you tell us about that, and then kind of like the the twelve hundred ninety days of sacrifice, the thirteen thirty five days and such. Yeah. So we get this scene in chapter twelve with these two men clothed in linen, right? And so they're talking to each other and swearing by Yahweh while they're while they're talking to one another. And and Daniel can hear this going on, but he's not really like cognizant of of exactly what they're saying. So Daniel, I mean, and this is kind of expression of 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 the overarching kind of like mindset of the time period, right? Like, like what's going to happen and, and when is it going to happen? Like, when are we going to like see our release from this oppression and things like that? Right. Cause we get here in uh, 12, eight, I heard, but could not understand. So I said, my Lord, what shall be the outcome of these things? And Michael, this is this archangel Michael, right? He says, go, go your way, Daniel, for the words are to remain secret and sealed until the time of the end this is this ambiguous like it's it's you know really a, a function of this apocalyptic secrecy and things like that um, but it's also eschatological in nature right um, says, many shall be purified cleansed and refined but the wicked shall continue to act wickedly haters gonna hate if you will <laughs> uh, glad to know that has a, a biblical precedent sure sure um, yeah, and, and so from the from the time that the regular burnt offering is taken away and the abomination that desolates is set up, so this is verse 11, chapter 12, right? So the regular burnt offering, this daily sacrifice, right, in the temple is removed and the abomination that desolates, or, the, you know, the pig on the altar is set up. So, again, this is um, prophecy ex eventu. So this is looking back on something that already happened, right? There shall be 1,290 days. So this number... <laughs> We can, this is tricky because this number is, I mean, it seems kind of random. And if this text is looking back on this time period, right, is looking back on, when it's being written, it's looking back on this pig being sacrificed on the altar, and they're looking for and trying to explain and predict, really, an end to the suffering. And if we go forward, I mean, 1,000, uh, I mean, 1,290 days is three and a half years. And then... We get what the three. It was so sorry. The uh, the thirteen thirty five is just a little bit longer, right? That comes in twelve twelve. So happier those who persevere and attain the the, the one thousand three hundred thirty five days. 
basically my immediate reaction to these two verses is that they're predicting an, an end to this time period of suffering. And then secondly, setting it up so that the people who make it through the suffering are going to be in a pretty good spot because presumably, right, 45 days past this 1290 that's referred to in verse 1211, it's almost like this cooldown period, it seems like, right, this month and a half after um, all this stuff is over with. Um, so and, we don't. So we don't really have any kind of like, unlike uh, with the the seventy sevens, we don't have this kind of harking back to anything. It just, it's kind of like it'll be a while. Uh, I think so, and I, I don't have Collins' commentary. And this is one of the tricky things is that you know, I mean, I think I mean, anytime you see large numbers in the Bible, it's usually usually indicative of just something that's a really long time. So in, in chapters 8 through 12, we have kind of this repeated theme of, of, of hearkening back to the earlier chapters about, you know, kingdoms falling in succession, but more specifically, because I don't even think Greece is mentioned, actually mentioned in the first seven chapters, but, it, you know, it comes up again and again and again, and you can correct me, you know, if I'm wrong about the seven chapters, but it comes up uh, just about in every chapter uh, in, in the later chapters as kind of, you know, na then Greece comes in, into power. Um, and so, you know, that can, that, you know, that can, the audience, it seems, and again, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, for these later chapters is to um, tie together these earlier prophecies, you know, regarding Babylon and succession of empires to the, the modern people at that time, you know, the, the contemporary readers who are reading this underneath this religious oppression. The, the later chapters tie themselves back into the imagery of the earlier chapters, but yeah. are more specific about who that who the, the successor kingdoms are. And they're very specific <laughs> about it's Greece, that kingdom that is oppressing you right now. And if you make it through that, then you will, you know, you will be rewarded with this kind of, right. you know, this, this uh, divine inheritance, I guess you could say. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, this latter third is, picking up on traditions that it had access to. So this, the, the, the latter third is, is going to try to tie itself into that as much as possible while trying to also accomplish its goals at the same time, namely providing hope for people who are in this really crappy circumstance, right? And so it's tapping into the apocalyptic imagery, but it's being a lot more blatant about it than a lot of the stuff that came beforehand, right? So it's, it's almost hard to misinterpret some of it because it's so blatant, right? With, with the goat and the ram, the horns, and like the direction that the horns, uh, that, that the goat and the ram are coming from, right? Because it's it's coming out of the east, right? Because they, they, like these animals are coming westward and northward and southward, but they're not coming eastward because that's where, that's where they're coming from. It's tying into this imagery, but it's using it in a little bit more of an explicit fashion, I think. It's less, it's a little, it's still coded. But it's, it's, still, a, it's a lot less subtle. You could say, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. and I it's mean, open to, it's it's not as open to your interpretation because it's being quite literal. Like this is Greece, and and leave it to Judah Mac Judah Maccabee to be less so, right? His nickname was the Hammer, <laughs> and so I mean, I'm not, I don't want to insinuate that I think that the Maccabees wrote this. I mean, it's possible. Did it? Was that the case? I, I, I don't know. Um, yeah, but you know, we certainly have it being contemporaneous with that time. Uh, but but we do have these. Uh, additional chapters that are not in every tradition, and that is, uh, I believe, the the Song of Susanna and uh, Bell and the Dragon. So right. when when did these come along? Yeah, so we have actually three sections. We've got the Song of Azariah. Oh, that's right. That was uh, the, it the tucked into an earlier prayer. chapter, right? Right. Yeah. So we have the Prayer of Azariah and the Song of the Three Young Men, which is one thing that gets inserted in the middle of chapter three, and then we have this what basically amounts to Daniel thirteen in Catholic editions of the Bible and also in Eastern Orthodox editions uh, called Susanna. And then we get what amounts to Daniel 14 in the same biblical traditions called Bell and the, Bell and the Dragon. So do we, do we know when these were added? I mean, were they added kind of at similar times? Were they uh, created over time? Uh, right. Do they come so, from different traditions? Yeah. Our, our best evidence for these are, um, it comes from Greek sources. Josephus doesn't know about them. He doesn't make any reference to them. Most of our uh, source data comes from Septuagental sources, so Greek sources, Greek translations. And uh, again, Protestant Bibles consider these texts to be apocryphal, so not every um, version of Daniel has them, obviously. 
so but we're probably dealing with something like maybe third century, I think CE even, because this is, I mean, if, if Josephus doesn't know what to do with it, then it's, it's, or doesn't, doesn't even make reference to it or doesn't have it, then it's going to be later than Josephus, and Josephus is what, first, second century CE? And uh, and so like with the idea about you know uh, in, you know uh, imperial Hebrew uh, or you know or, or old Aramaic or whatever do we do we see these uh, these uh, these later editions written in a different um, a different style a different uh, form a, a later form of Hebrew or you know you say it's, we mostly find it in Greek but do we find these in Hebrew as well or the purely Greek texts? No, it's it's purely Greek as far as I know. I'm pretty certain it's just it's strictly Greek. Uh, because you, you get them in, in the Septuagint, so if you, if you go out and buy just a, a, a like Rolf's edition of the Septuagint, it's included in, the, in like these texts or these expansions or um, extra chapters or this bonus material, right? Uh, the, extra, the extra DVD is included in uh, the Septuagint, and so there's a possibility that um, these texts uh, are of Christian origin. Although I mean, if they're if they're really late, although. Um, I mean, I say that because early Christian groups are the ones who adopted the Septuagint as their base text, and so like that was those are the traditions where these texts survived. So we see them in like early strands of Theodotion. But so what are these? You know, what do these actually add into the texts? You know, so the uh, the the prayer of Azariah. Um, is is tucked into an earlier chapter, and then these these two other, you know, Susanna and and Bell and the Dragon kind of come uh, a little later at the end. Yeah, so uh, we'll start with this, the prayer of Azariah and the song of the three young men. So this is added in in between Daniel 3.23 and 3.24, and it's this extensive prayer, basically, and song of these guys when they're down in the furnace. It's very doxological in nature, and it's um, really an expression of mid-suffering Judaism and things of that nature. That's that's about the extent of it. It's it's a really nice little addition that I unfortunately doesn't get retained in 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 most Bibles. But so but yeah, it's not it's not adding any extra you know theological or you know uh, philosophical kind of implications. It's just kind of like oh this you know and this is what they talked about and why they were in the fire kind of thing. Right. I mean, it's certainly got some theological implications as far as like perceptions of Yahweh and Yahweh's ability to save and things like that. And there, because partially part of it is, is because you get some ambiguity as far as the Aramaic in the actual Masoretic text, where you get a verse in chapter three that you can, you can translate either if our God is able to save, he will save, or you can also translate it as if our God is able to save, let him save. So there's a certain, like, where from a, a translating perspective, there's a bit of ambiguity there as far as how to render those verbs um, and whether or not they should be modalized. Or it really impinges on, like, how certain these individuals are in the narrative of, like, their God's ability to save them. And so the prayer is, the prayer in the song is kind of um, related to that in, in a lot of ways. That's that, that's kind of what's going on in that section. So what you're saying is that it has uh, some implications for people who like to parse Aramaic, but for the rest of us, uh, it's not going you know it's not going to change the overall thrust of the text in a way. No, no, I don't think so. <laughs> I mean, it's it's reflective of kind of I don't want to say standard because I, what we don't want to do is normativize any views or any any forms of Judaism or anything like that. Um, but it's not unpredictable Second Temple Jewish soteriology, or even Christian to a certain extent. So that is to say, soteriology meaning what a text said, has to say about salvation. So does does the song uh, make it more or less certain? Uh, it's 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 expressive of certainty. Yeah. So uh, so as far as our content is concerned for this for this prayer and the song of the three young men. We have they're, they're walking in the midst of the furnace, in the midst of the fire, praising God and blessing Yahweh. And this this guy Azariah stands up, and he's you know um, one of Daniel's three friends, uh, and he begins praying in the midst of this fire. And it's very doxological in nature. So blessed are you, O Lord God of our fathers. Thy name, your name, is worthy to be praised and glorified forever. Uh, you are 
uh, righteous in all things that you uh, have done for us. Verily, true are all your works and your ways are right. So it's, it's very doxological and, and even confessional to a certain point. In, in, he goes on, in all things we have trespassed not, and not obeyed your commands nor kept them. So there's a certain inconsistency with the narrative. And so it's almost like this prayer is kind of fitted into its context because of, of what you get at the beginning, right? And then the rest of it is very kind of neutral psalm type language. With some, with some, a few little things sprinkled uh, here throughout. So it's very similar to a lot of the other doxological praise type stuff that you get elsewhere uh, in Daniel itself. But then too, it also participates in this like later kind of trend uh, that you see in things like Third Enoch, where you get like lists of angels and things like that. But um, that that like you get lists of angels over all types of various parts of creation, and in the latter portions of this, you get this list of all these different things. So, oh you fire and heat, bless the Lord. Oh you winter and summer. Oh you dews and storms of snow. So it's calling upon all these various acts, uh, aspects of nature and creatures and nations and people to praise Yahweh. So it's very doxological in nature. It's very, it's, it's describing a lot of praise to Yahweh and expectant for Yahweh to, to act on their behalf. So it's, it's, it's within uh, the genre of kind of later text, but does kind of fit in, I guess, with, with Daniel as well. But uh, moving on, uh, what about the, the uh, Susanna? Because yeah. this, this seems <laughs> just like, um, this seems, because when we get into Susanna and, and Bell and the Dragon, these seem a little more, um, I guess you could say shoehorned in kind of, it seems yeah. they seem a little less connected to the rest of Daniel. So what happens in Susanna? Susanna re- is really the most shoehorned because you have this woman named Susanna who is very fair, right? She's, she's lovely to look at. Um, and then you get these two priests and <clears throat> they see her and they both want to, um, copulate with her um and so basically Susanna is the story of these two priests trying to uh basically rape this woman and And so just to you know to to put this into the context of the rest of Daniel are we talking these are uh Babylonian priests are we talking these are uh, Jewish priests in exile you know, do we, you know, because most most chapters in Daniel start with kind of like in the reign of yada yada. Um, right. You know, do we have a time period for when this is happening or, or the context? Yeah. So uh, we are uh, in Babylon for the narrative context. And this is concerning. So, so these two priests or these two elders, right, were from the people uh who had and they had been appointed as judges. So right, so that year, two elders from the people. This is the fifth verse of Susanna or uh, Daniel 13, if you will. Uh, so that year, that it is the year of the narrative context. Two elders from the people were appointed as judges. Concerning them, the Lord has said, wickedness came forth from Babylon from elders who were judges who were supposed to govern the people. So we get a couple of things happening here. We get this story that shoehorned into Daniel about these two elders who are not acting appropriately, right? And there's also a certain amount of exegesis happening here too, right? This is just a a way of giving an example of this quotation, right? Wickedness came forth from Babylon, from elders who were judges. So it's interacting, this, this text is interacting with texts that had come before it and expounding upon it in an interpretive way. So what actually happens in Susanna then? Because <laughs> we, we kind of left on a cliffhanger there uh, about these two elders. Uh, I mean, as you put it, essentially designed to rape her. Right. Um, so Susanna goes to bathe in her garden. And uh, the two priests sneak in there and try to, you know, perpetrate this deed. And Susanna calls out. I mean, part of this is... Um, how the, the way in which Yahweh acts and things like that, right? Uh, so there's a certain amount of um, soteriology wrapped up in this as well. And so around the middle of the text here, Susanna has been um, violated, more or less, right? And these two elders, they stand up before the people and they laid their hands on their head and through her tears, that is that is Susanna's, she looks up to heaven and the, the elders throw her under the bus. And this is par for the course 
uh, victim blaming, right? This is because the, the elder said, while we were walking in the garden alone, this woman came in with two maids, shut the garden doors, and dismissed the maids. So they're blaming her for this deed, right? And then, and then they say, then a young man who was hiding there came to came to her and lay with her. And so they're trying to also throw it on Daniel. Yeah, and Daniel and, just kind of appears in the text out of out of almost nowhere. Uh, I mean, well, really out of a corner of the garden, right? We were in, or, uh, or, or in, out of a bush, right? Because he's presumably hiding in, in, in the garden. And, and so this is related. Um, what we get out of, out of Susanna and what we get out of Bell and the Dragon is this kind of like um, detective. This is like CSI Daniel edition. <laughs> because Daniel becomes this detective and, and is able to untangle these, these lies slash mysteries, right? Because Daniel is the one who basically uncovers the truth in all this stuff. And so you have Yahweh who hears the cry of Susanna. You know, they're laying this false charge against me. And as she's being let off to be executed, Daniel gets this spirit stirred up within him, and he stands up and he's like, I want no part in shedding this woman's blood. And then all the all the people turn and ask him, what, what, are you, what are you talking about? And Daniel retorts, are you such fools of Israel as, as to condemn a daughter of Israel without examination, without learning the facts? So we have lawyer Daniel, you know, you know, Daniel Esquire, um, to the rescue here. And Daniel, um, just like in Bell, Bell and Dragon, becomes this, like, discerner of facts and and I, I should go back and correct myself because I said that Daniel was the one who was hiding in the garden but uh, it's it's unspecified really um, it's just a random guy yeah, uh, but, but Daniel does a, it appears very suddenly in the text just as I guess you could say this chapter appears very suddenly in Daniel yeah. Cause, I mean, <laughs> Yeah. I mean, so uh, the thing that struck me reading this is that it seems to have absolutely no connection to the rest of Daniel, except for the fact that, I mean, it's it's going back to this idea of Daniel as kind of this folk hero. Um, right. This is just kind of like, you know, because the, the main, you know, chapters 1 through 12 of Daniel, we've, we've gone through and we've had... Um, essentially this establishment of, of uh, the Jewish people as um, being favored by God and then proving that through their their gifts of interpretation and salvation and, you know, uh, being able to hang out with lions and, and being able to kind of prophesy as, as well. It, in this case, it uh, it doesn't fit the format. It, it doesn't fit the content. I mean, how did this get, how did this get into Daniel? For the people who include it, uh, Merely, I think, on the merit of Daniel's mention in the text in the first place. And so it, it participates in a genre of Second Temple Jewish literature known as parabiblical literature that claims the authority right, of, of some kind of traditional hero or important character like Daniel to garner authority for the text itself. And so that's how it gets in there is, is by having Daniel as a part of it. Because you could replace Daniel with... You know, I mean, it's it's marketing, right? I mean, it is what it is because you get, you know, if I were to be the Haynes representative on TV, no, like nobody would care, but you get Michael Jordan as the Haynes representative in Haynes commercials. You know, he's going to sell some underwear. I'm not, right? Uh, I, mean, I mean, don't sell yourself short, but <laughs> yeah, but it, you know, it does seem like it, it, I mean, it's it's only then there because it's another story of Daniel proving his kind of exceptionalness. And, and I mean, oh. and, and, and to move on to Bell and the Dragon, I mean, it, which is a little more, I guess, a little more in, in line with the rest of Daniel, but it, it seems like yet another kind of, um, here's Daniel doing something amazing. So uh, go ahead and just kind of give us a, the, the summary of Bell and the Dragon then, because we've already kind of uh, yeah. touched on it. Yeah, so we get this, uh, we kind of have two scenes. We get this first scene where uh, you have the Dan, you have the Dan, you have Daniel, and and so he's this companion of King Astyages, who was, the, the, Astyages was presumably the father of Cyrus, the Persian. And although, the, I mean, I should note too that the background for like Cyrus's background is rather complex and weird, but so you get Daniel who's kind of buddy buddy with this king, and um, the king wants Daniel to worship these idols, and uh, Daniel of course refuses, and so they have this contest, and this is almost reminiscent of Elijah and the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel in in First Kings eighteen, if it's that should no first Kings 18 and 19 where you have Elijah and the prophets of Baal and they have this contest over, you know, whose God is real. Right. And so they both set up altars. They douse them with, they, they put all the wood on there. They douse it with water. And then they say, okay, the, the God who's able to light this without setting fire to it 
right? Basically sending fire down from heaven is the, is the true God. Of course, Yahweh wins, and so does Elijah, right? So you get a very similar situation set up here where you have Daniel questioning how it is the food that's offered to this idol named Bel gets eaten, because the king seems to be convinced that uh, the idol itself is eating it. But Daniel says, no, 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 no. This is just this clay object that's just covered in bronze, and it's it's completely m like mute, it's dumb, it's deaf, it can't do anything. Meanwhile, we have these priests of Bel who have this trap door in the sanctuary, and so the king seals off the sanctuary for this contest. So they set the meal out, and Daniel's like, I'm going to figure this out, right? So this, the king seals off the sanctuary, and then before he does, Daniel lays down this, all this, these ashes on the floor, right? Which is ingenious. Because the, he knows on some level that the priests have this trap door under, like in the floor of this sanctuary. And so they come in at night to, to, have these, like to eat this food with their families. And so Daniel, because he's laid these ashes down on the floor, he's able to see their footprints on the ground and stuff like that. So the next day they go in and they're able to figure out that it's the priests who are, have been the ones who've been eating this food and it's not the idol, right? So it's one of these, another one of these things where it's saying, okay, Yahweh is the true God. It's not Bell. It's not, uh, Bell, of course, is just a shortening of the, of the name Baal. So that's kind of our first kind of half of the story here. The second half is a very similar thing where the king is trying to get Daniel to um, worship this snake or this dragon, and Daniel refuses. And so basically, uh, Daniel says, look, look, I'm not going to worship this thing, but rather instead I'm going to kill it without any kind of weapon. And essentially what Daniel does is puts together this like gastric Molotov cocktail uh, with pitch, fat, and hair, and he boils them together, and he makes these cakes, and he feeds them to this snake or this dragon, and then the dragon eats them, and he, it bursts open. And he says, look at what you've been worshiping. And ultimately, like, like the thrust of both of these stories is that <clears throat> these idols, these non yahwistic objects of worship are not worth your time, right? They're, they're, they're not worth the adoration that, you're, that, that, to, that they're receiving. Yeah, this is what uh, it, it at least made me think that this part was a little more um, in line with the rest of Daniel because it is kind of this, um, it, it, at least proving that, yeah, okay, in a, in a very public, uh, elite way saying, uh, my God is very powerful. You know, I am, yes. I am the services, uh, I am in the service of a, of a righteous God, the righteous God, of course, you know, of course this is monotheistic and it can go on there, but, right. uh, but one thing we see again in here in, <laughs> um, just to kind of hammer home the fact that this is connected to the rest of Daniel, that he gets thrown into a lion's den again. Yeah, yeah. So uh, we find <laughs> we find poor Daniel, poor poor Daniel, back in the lion's den again after he kills this dragon, and it just so happens, and, well, and so okay, so Daniel's down there for for about a week, right? And it just so happens that there are seven lions in the den, and that every day these lions have been fed two humans, so they're they're pretty well used to you know a, a pretty steady diet of of people. But I mean, and, and sheep. They get a couple of sheep per day too. But mostly, mostly humans, because humans are bigger than sheep. So, um, but when Daniel's thrown in there, they're given nothing, so that they're starving, ravenous, and they're gonna, you know. And there's no doubt, you know. They're so they're stacking the deck right against Daniel. There's no doubt that that these these lions are gonna eat Daniel because they haven't fed these lions for for a few days. And it just so happens that the prophet Habakkuk, who's one of the biblical prophets is in the book of the 12. Many people will have heard of the book of the book by that same name, Habakkuk, uh, just a couple of chapters. Um, he happened to be in Judea and he made a stew and then broken bread into a bowl. Here I'm just reading the text um, and was going into the field to take it to the reapers. But this messenger of Yahweh said to Habakkuk, yo, yo, yo hold up. That's not a direct quote. Uh, <laughs> take the food that you have to Babylon to Daniel in the lion's den. And Habakkuk is, is like, I've never even been there. Like, I know nothing about this, this den of lions. How am I going to get there? And, and so this messenger picks Habakkuk up by the top of his head, which is very reminiscent of Ezekiel and the way in which the spirit of Yahweh takes Ezekiel around to different places. And so he sets, he sets Habakkuk down in, in Babylon, right over the lion's den, and Habakkuk miraculously shouts because... Um, he hasn't been told the name of Daniel, so he just I can't, just kind of happens to know it, I guess. He says, Daniel, Daniel, take the food that God has sent you. Uh, and so, you know, kind of magically, Habakkuk shows up and feeds Daniel. And so Daniel survives, and it, oddly enough, says nothing about the lions. Yeah, not, that's like, what's tricky. It, it's, 
uh, Havoc uh, feeds Daniel, but not the lions. Right. So the lions like, presumably are still hungry. Yeah. Well, you know, it, it, I mean, it is hard. I mean, if you hearken back to chapter six, it's, you know, uh, obviously, you know, Yahweh has, has shut up their mouths. But I mean, I assume Daniel's in there for a week. He, he, he could probably use a snack. <laughs> oh, for sure. Um, I mean, hungry? Why wait? Call Habakkuk. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, so I mean, this is kind of a, a replaying of of chapter six in a way to kind of show that even you know even if you were to throw kind of if we were to call Daniel a prophet or a semi prophet or just kind of a, a holy man or a chosen man or you know a touched man or whatever uh, of of Yahweh to just kind of show that you know you can you can put them in you know in these you know pernicious situations uh, and they'll come through it just fine as through the, kind of the to show the power of of Yahweh, right. Right. Yeah. They, these heroes like Daniel, I mean, one of, okay. So I mean, one of the, one of the, there's, you've got this long running joke that if you've got three or four main characters in the same place in the movie at the same time, they're probably not going to die. So you can think of like, you know, if everybody's in the Millennium Falcon, you know, they'll be, they'll probably be okay. So a similar kind of thing. If you've got your hero, like your heroes don't normally die in the Bible. Right. I mean, only on occasion, and in in, in 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 the places that they do, they're kind of anti-heroes. So like Samson dies, but he's an anti-hero, right? Um, I mean, there is that Jesus fellow. Well, that's a whole other situation. We're just talking Hebrew Bible here. Uh, <laughs> yeah, Jesus dies, and he he's kind of one of the only ones, right, in the tradition, as far as like specific main heroes are concerned. And oh, John the Baptist, he gets beheaded. Yeah, but I mean, yeah, of course, like you said, you know, in the Hebrew Bible, we're really dealing with um, kind of cultural heroes who are, are there to kind of, I guess, you know, because, you know, John the Baptist, is, his death is to signify kind of the, the tyranny of, of, of Rome and uh, Jesus' death right. is to, you know, redeem the entire world. Right. Um, but, you know, so, you know, with uh, Habakkuk and, and Daniel, of course, you don't have that. They're there to, if I'm, if I'm interpreting this correctly, uh, the the main thrust of Daniel, if I were to say, is to prove is to kind of be a book that shows the power of uh, of the the Jewish people and their God. Yeah, yeah, and I mean a, a big part of it is is highlighting identity vis a vis you know the inside vis a vis outside, right? Um, Jews versus the world in this context, you know, so keeping themselves distinct and pure in such a fashion that they don't have to assimilate. Right, because if you're not eating pig, if you're uh, continuing to circumcise your children and teach them about the law of Moses, right, um, then you're maintaining the tradition and uh, you're keeping yourself distinct, distinct from the other. Yeah, I mean, in the sense that you know, uh, you know, Daniel, his faith saved him in a lion's den, and you can't even keep kosher. <sighs> <laughs> so, but I mean, that's, I mean, I think we've kind of well established that that is uh, kind of the thrust of this book that we've been talking about. But you know, we've also talked about the fact that uh, it does have some kind of very distinctive uh, problems in historical chronology. So yeah. uh, to just kind of round out the, our, our kind of final section here, could you tell us a little bit about how Daniel has been interpreted over the years, you know, going from religious book um, to you know, going from a, from a Hebrew religious book into the the Christian canon, um, and then on into uh, kind of more uh, biblical scholarly study uh, in, into the modern day. Yeah. So, um, as we talked a bit about the original audience for this in the second century BC, we've we've kind of harped on that a lot. Christian interpretation, in a lot of ways, it it, it's, it largely depends on which camp is looking at it. But you get a lot of Christ-oriented interpretation, uh, particularly in Daniel 7 with the Son of Man. A lot of people like to interpret that as being Jesus. And, and uh, of course, for, um, or, 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 or rather, when, when you consider Christian apocalypticism in the first century in books like Revelation, of course, Daniel um, and Revelation have some connections, um, at least from a synchronic perspective uh, or a canonical criticism perspective. Some of those connections from a Christian perspective are made more readily apparent. And so the the ideas about rescue and salvation, saving acts of God and things like that are um, from a Christian for, from several Christian perspectives oriented towards looking looking forward to Jesus. How does this play forward in 
um, more modern scholarship of the Bible, yeah. you know, because we do have, uh, you know, we have talked about how Daniel does have this kind of, you know, earlier and later parts and it's Hebrew and it's Aramaic and it's, you know, there's different imagery and historical events involved. You know, how is this, uh, what is the role of Daniel in the study, in, in kind of modern academic Bible studies? As different individuals progress through their through their training uh, and then into their um, careers of research and writing and things like that, uh, we all tend to focus on different things. And so you get so you get a few people who have spent a considerable amount of time on looking at Daniel. So we get people like John Collins. John Collins is is one of the the foremost Second Temple Jewish lit Dead Sea Scrolls Hebrew apocalypticism uh, scholars out there. He teaches at Yale. I would highly recommend his commentary on the book of Daniel and the Hermeneia series to anyone listening and interested in that kind of thing. So from a scholarly perspective, I don't, I can't speak for the entire field, obviously. I can speak for myself and, and um, for what I've seen in most of the scholarship that I've read is that Daniel represents a um, collection of kind of legendary actions um, by this folkloristic character. It falls into this tradition of Jewish apocalypticism and is probably not, um, I mean, it's refl- okay, so it's reflective of certain historical realities, but it is not necessarily, or even just not in t- not at all, reflective of historical realities of the 6th century BCE in Babylon. And so we have some problems, for example, with the kings that are, the, the kings of Babylon. So we start off with Nebuchadnezzar, right, and then we go to Bel- Belshazzar, um, and then we go to Darius, but then we go back to Belshazzar, right, in, in I think it's chapter 7, um, after Belshazzar has already died in chapter 5. So we have problems with that. We have problems that we've already talked about with Darius the Mede. So ultimately, and, and, and then we also get some problems too as far as the, like with some of the predictive stuff that appears later on in the book um, in 8 through 12, that once Antiochus the Fourth Epiphanes, once we get to his death, the things after that, tend, like as far as predictions are concerned, tend to get a little shaky. So what we have is a, a collection of imaginative, apocalyptic literature that is tapping into certain historical realities and using names that are historically authoritative to garner for itself more authority for its audience. Hosky, thank you very much for going through it in, in detail and talking about the book of Daniel and its and its place uh, within the the Hebrew Bible and and uh, and kind of uh, the the Jewish and Christian faiths in general. Um, do you have any kind of final closing thoughts you want to share with us? I, I mean, I, I mean, I would just encourage people to um, not be afraid of or or hesitant about just in, uh, being able to enjoy the biblical text as as literature and. Sure, there are communities that have adopted adopted the text as a basis for their confessional belief, and that's fine, as, you know, as long as they're not hurting people. But we can still, I know there are a lot of people out there who want to write the text off, and I, I kind of touched on this in the first podcast I did with you all, but it, it, there's a lot of interesting stuff that, um, that even though this text may not be exactly reflective of a Babylonian context or, or the Babylonian exile, it's reflective of certain historical realities about Jewish identity um, in the Persian and, and Hellenistic periods, and so um, it's valuable in insofar as as that is concerned, and um, if nothing else, you know, aside from its linguistic and philological and 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 literary value. So, and plus, it's just fun. I mean, a lot of these stories are just fun. Um, we don't have to rely on them necessarily for anything, but they, but but they're in, in, enjoyable to read. I think so. I hope I hope this encourages people to just you know get into the text and just um, appreciate it more for for what it is. Well, thanks so much for speaking with us, and uh, we wish you the very very best uh, in finishing up that dissertation. Hey, thanks so much. And as always, thank you, the listener, for uh, tuning in. Uh, no tuning in like this is a radio show uh, podcast so uh but thank you for listening and downloading and uh the episode and streaming on your various rss feeds and uh hey do you know we're on youtube now uh yeah ask historians is a youtube channel um we're, we're putting up the the podcast episode by episode it's a it's a labor of love uh so it, it's not you know going up it, you know, it, it, it'll take some time to get everything up there. We do have some episodes and they are long, but um, yeah, uh, Jaff's uh, Mike, uh, who is uh, now my behind the scenes co-host 
is uh, putting those up and he's building these nice uh, indexed menus for them. So they, they come out, they look really great. Uh, and it's nice to go back and revisit the, uh, the, or the, or the history of the Ask Historians podcast. Um, but yeah, I was, I was happy to have Husky come back and talk to us about uh, a single book in the Bible. You know, it's, it's the Bible itself is a very dense, dense, dense text. So um, it can be interpreted in any number of ways. So it was, it was fun to go through just kind of one book and kind of say, well, what is, why is this here? What does this mean? You know, why include this? Why not include this? What are they really trying to say? So um, yeah, I hope you enjoyed it as well. Um, if you haven't enjoyed it, I don't know why you've listened this far. It's kind of odd. Um, but yeah, hey, each their own. So uh, coming up uh, next uh, fortnight, in the next episode, uh, we will be talking to Cordis Mellum, a flared user on Ask Historians and moderator over at our uh, sister sub, Bad History. Uh, we will be talking uh, not about Bad History, but about the Great Leap Forward, uh, which is, well, I mean, I guess it's bad decisions in history, but uh, not bad history itself. So uh, come back and uh, hope you uh, tune in again for that. You've been listening to the Ask Historians podcast. For more history like this, visit us at reddit.com slash r slash askhistorians and ask over a hundred historians and enthusiasts anything you want to know in history. Find us on Twitter as at Ask Historians, and subscribe to the show on iTunes. Or visit askhistorians.libsyn.com. Thank you very much for listening, and join us next time on the Ask Historians podcast.